Thanks, uh, Greg and Joe and everyone for having me here. Um, you know, I sort of work from about Cobar down to southern Tasmania uh, and sort of across into South Australia, into that mid-north and uh, upper north of South Australia. So in those type of environments throughout that. Uh, that. So um, we live down in uh, southwest Victoria, south of Hamilton in a high rainfall area and I um, manage the Native Grass Association but you know I came from ryegrass and coxfoot and phalaris so like my skills aren't that great so I was hoping Joe could do the ID when we're out in the paddock and stuff. I usually take someone with me from the Native Grass Association so that I know a few but not very many. What uh, what I was just going to try and do that, conditions for regeneration, I'm going to focus a lot just on that grazing, but just sort of weave back a bit in through that profitability and risk and like Joe's question and stuff. So, but overwhelmingly, what I want us to go away with is something to do, something to trial, something to check, something to know that you're matching the stocking rate, something that you know, you're actually incorporating, you're kickstarting, all those things. So something to do when you go home. Because uh, if we don't do that, I find that it doesn't come easy to change. And it's really hard to get that information into you because your land has different characteristics than other people's. It's in different environments. It's going to have a different fertility profile and different suite of species. So you need to know how to manage that. So I really want to focus on that, but it's not complicated and it's not hard. But so the conditions needed, and that's about that landscape function and being able to recognise it. And we'll go out and make sure that we can recognise that on the land. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? But the overwhelmingly, what to do next? So not just sort of, this isn't good, what do I do now is the big one. That's where people get stuck. So we won't do um, a science project, we'll just do enough so that you can then say, okay, I know what to do next. But it'll be based on evidence. So when I go to people's place and they, they'll say, yeah, recovery time's really important for this. It's very simple. It's about letting the grasses recover and then utilising them well. Incredibly simple idea, but very hard to do in practice. So show me the evidence, I say to people, that those grasses have recovered, that you're giving them long enough. And they go like this, they go, oh, and they go, I think. I go, no, 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 this is important. I want evidence. And they go, oh, and that's why we do those trials as well. So that you've got evidence on your land. If during the day you hear a number of months or whatever come out on recovery, it will be wrong if it comes out of my mouth. It must be wrong. And if it was accidentally right, it would be wrong next year because it doesn't take into account rainfall seasons, aspects, soil fertility, all those other things. So we'll have to uh, work through and just show how to do that. And, be, and we need to be systematic to make it work is what I've found. So we need to have good structure about what our thinking is, keep it really simple um, and make it work. Um, I tend to get into trouble and I've stopped doing this because I used to flog the current system. You know, so really give it a caning and I enjoy it sort of thing, but no one else does is what I've found. So I won't go on to it. That, you know, so I'll only do the briefest bit and I've put all my slides onto one. So the debt's going out of control, the profit's coming out of the businesses. Uh, this is cropping. Uh, this is all broad acre industries with off-farm income taken out. Um, the top 20% of farmers in New South Wales aren't making a positive cash flow when you take off farm income out. Do you know, like I was always told, it doesn't matter what you do, you can be a cropper, a dairy, you know, sheep, cattle, as long as you're in the top 20%. Well, that's, they're starting to fail. So I, so I won't go over, and I liken it to driving over the cliff. So many practices that I see work, but they drive us over the cliff. And the language I do is that like down our way, you know, we do a lot of um, sort of chicory, plantain, lucerne, you know, things like that. Um, lots of high clover. Do you know, like I'm not a, don't like clover at all. And, you know, and that just drives people crazy. And I go, I'm not arguing that it doesn't finish the animals. What I'm arguing is the operation was a success, but the patient dies. And we've got to have farming that the patient gets better. 
So I'm not saying that you can't finish them, just from my point of view, and I'll try and justify that, it, it, the, the, the patient dies. So it's really that sort of, what's the point for me? I can't see the point. You know, they'll say, oh, you know, it grew at 1.8 kilos a day or something for cattle or steers and stuff. And I go, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Do you know? So it, um, it's about that type of stuff. So I won't do too much on that. I think that we really need to be strong that we never take advice. I'm writing a series of a newsletters uh, for Stiper. Never take advice, and I usually say, especially from a little fella from southwest Victoria. Because it depends from their point of view. This is um, financial risk in mixed farming, so percentage of crop 30%, 60%. And 100%. And when you do the gross margin, the profit, and the cash margin calculated, it looks like you, the more you do, the better. But if you actually factor in rainfall and prices, which is what uh, uh, Hutchings and Norblom did here, it's actually better to be there. But that's on one run of the model that they run it through. So we're not getting advice that's taking into account our risk. So we need to be really good and clear. And the advice I give to people, they go, I think I'm going to halve my stocking rate. And I say, we need to tinker. We need to maybe adjust by 10%. Was that better or was that worse? It's a like searching for the top of this graph that I think of as profitability increasing and then it just crashes like that. So you may as well be over here as over here if this is dollars and this is profit and this is uh, maybe stocking rate or something. So where is this? You've got to tinker to find it because it shifts. It's like what Greg was saying, you know, this year they were slightly over. You know, what are they going to do next year if it's setting up the same way? What are you going to do about the use? What are you going to do about that? How do we tinker to make sure that we're finding that? Because it's that complex. Farming is that complex that you can't just make a statement, you're better off in 100% crop because it will be wrong. You know, like um, some people are keeping more dry stock. I say you've got to have animals that you don't like because otherwise, if you've got all breeders, you won't sell them. If you've got all this, you, can, you, know, you can't do so. People are having sort of weathers, they're having steers, they're having, you know, like I always say, you know, like down our way, there's lots of you know, those Angus breeders. Like, oh, you might need a few Herefords. Yeah, like, you know, like so, which is sort of a bit upsetting for them. But, you know, like, so, um, but animals that you don't like, so you would have been happy if they'd gone last week. So you need that to be flexible. We we typically in a typical year could carry about two thirds of our carrying capacity as 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 breeders. With these last summers and stuff, we're looking at sort of fifty percent of our breeders. So we're going to adjust sort of what is that level and how do you fill it up and top it up and all those different ways. Other people I'm working with are making sure when it's growing, they do not have animals. You know, when they've got food, because they then buy when everyone else hasn't got food. So they're actually shifting their feed over into this period um, when the prices are low and things like that. So they're, they're taking a different view, whereas I sort of want to eat the grass when it's growing. They're sort of saying, let it grow. I'll, I'll make more money by being able to buy cheap stock when other people are run out. So they're picking at that sort of counter cyclic. So um, we'll be talking about the decay part of the carbon cycle. It's a living process. It requires moisture and life. I was going to go pretty quick. Is that all right? It's, um, so it just, a lot of people have heard this before, it tends to be a leading indicator, tends to be fungi. So have you got active uh, decomposition and visible fungal attack uh, on the litter that's in the system? So uh, we block up this carbon cycle because we don't complete that and we're not allowing that to happen. Uh, most of the damage is done from raindrops hitting bare ground. I'm saying, you know, like uh, people say 100% ground cover 100% of the time, which was Christine Jones and, you know, bare grounds, public enemy number one. How do we get it covered? How do we get that cover? And then it's got to be perennial grass. This is um, um, one of the most complicated slides you can think of. But what this is about is that David Tongway and Norm Hindley were asked by CSIRO at the next rainfall, what will happen? Will the water infiltrate or run off? Will the land be stable or will it erode? 
and will it cycle nutrients or not? So will, that was what they were asked and they measured everything and these came out as the top three. Is it covered? Yeah, you know, there's no mystery there. We know that we sort of have been ground into us. We know that it's going to be cooler in summer, warmer in winter, uh, breaks the impact of the soil, uh, the raindrops on the soil, doesn't allow it to be capped. But the other thing was the, this is this basal cover. So the bases of the perennial grasses, what percentage of that hectare is covered with perennial grasses? And then between those perennial grasses, is there litter cover? And then is that litter decomposing? If that litter isn't decomposing, it inhibits growth and becomes a problem. If it's decomposing, it drives your nutrient cycle and releases all the nutrients. So the nutrients that you want in the soil, the phosphorus, the nitrogen, all those go up. And the ones that you don't want, the sodium and the aluminium and things go down. So he's done all this work. I started to write this thing about, you know, I think CSIRO is schizophrenic because like half of them sort of tell me how to fix it and half of them tell me you can't. So, do you know, like, but it's more than half that tell you you can't. But he, he actually worked this out. Uh, David Tongway is just fantastic. I've spent a few days with him and it's like having access to every soil research paper that's been written for the last 30 to 40 years. It's just fantastic. Yeah, it's like one of the best things I can do. So, but, um, so, but that's the simple thing. So cover, perennial grass and decomposing litter. That's the target we're heading for. So what does that look like? How are we going to do it? It's available on the internet if you really like that sort of stuff and links back to all the research papers. And uh, there's actually a training Excel spreadsheet that you can do. Um, I'll try and just sort of run you through a quick look at that when we go outside. But it's crucial for knowing, is the land functioning well? Is it stable, infiltrating water and cycling nutrients? So they're really big things, the most foundation blocks of what we're looking at. Um, this is some of this idea of litter and getting pushed onto the soil surface to cycle into the soil surface. Um, I've been using that photo because it was sort of um, what happened at the end of the 0607 summer, which was pretty tough down in southwest Victoria. It would have been all right up here, normal sort of. <laughs> so, uh, that slight decomposition of the litter, so it's, it's, it's decomposing. It looks like compost. So that litter, that if you could pull that apart and dig down through it, what you'll find is this decomposing layer. There shouldn't be a soil surface. If you scrape the litter off, and oh, sorry about the thing enough. If you scrape the litter off, you shouldn't find the dirt. And when we do, you'll be able to knock on it and it'll sound like a drum, because if you find the dirt, it will be capped and it'll sound a bit hollow and like a drum. So, it needs to be a transition layer from raw litter, this yellow, fresh, raw litter, into decomposing litter, less decomposing, a little bit more soil, until you eventually get into the soil. So um, this is what, uh, in May, um, this is at a place just south of uh, Colac, and that's moderate decomposition. So you're starting to see visible fungal attack. And we got another one, but it was down in the Huon on, um, on Sunday, I found the, the guys doing a really good job because once you get that insulation layer and it's being pressed onto the soil so that the life in the soil can get hold of it, then it'll cycle and it'll recharge your nutrient cycle and it makes everything available. So all the sites that Sydney Uni have done through New South Wales, they've all got more phosphorus than the ones that are adding phosphorus. They've all got more nitrogen They've got massive amounts of nitrogen. We've got an action on the ground um, carbon farming project. We've got 13 farms, six in um, Victoria and seven in, um, in New South Wales. And we're looking at creating these conditions because once you do this, the soil carbon goes up as well. So that's been proven. But in, yeah, like I was trying to get the action on the ground round two, which was demonstrating how do we uh, reduce nitrous oxides and methane and stuff?
But where, you know, so there's a model on the internet by Richard Eckard from Melbourne University, and you can punch in all the cropping parameters, and it punches out how much nitrous oxide and methane and stuff. So I said, oh, I'll do a pasture cropping one like Cole Sice. We'll put in a project for that. So I put in a quarter of the nitrogen fertilizer, two thirds of the diesel, which is what we can do, and no burning of the stubble, because the one they had had burning of the stubble. It came out worse than burning the stubble and doing full nitrogen. Okay, what? So I wrote to Richard Eckhart on the email, and he says, oh, we, we think it might be wrong. And I go, you think? <laughs> yeah, like so. But what happens was in cropping, in cropping, there's not enough nitrogen in the system. The carbon nitrogen ratio is so high that it won't decompose. It can only oxidize. So the litter will go gray and oxidize up into the air. Whereas we actually want it to biological decay and go down into the soil. So if you can't get enough nitrogen in, and it's getting the perennial grasses, the riser sheaths of the perennial in that, the root zones of those, that's where all that nitrogen's being formed. We've got numbers on this that show that uh, we can have um, up to two tonnes per hectare of nitrogen in that soil that's in organic nitrogen form. So freely available to break down all the litter and to get this um, moderate uh, decomposition. Um, when I started working with David Tongway, he'd never seen really good grazing. So he said, you will not get moderate decomposition in grasslands. And then he went like this, he goes, oh, you might be able to. So he changed like that. So every time I get one, I send him a photo. Yeah, I go, I've identified this as moderate decomposition. Do you agree? And like he's studying, yes, Graham. You know, like, so just annoying. When you look at an annual grass or an annual plant, they tend to worry about themselves. And I've been saying, I think they've got a Y chromosome in there. So they look after themselves and don't look after anyone else. Whereas the perennial, yeah, the, 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 it's not, it doesn't always work all well when you've got male audience. So it's all male. Yeah, like so. <laughs> but, the, but the perennial grasses, they're interested in improving the soil around them. So they want to make the conditions better. So you can use the annual grass to get started to create the conditions for the perennial, but you can't stay at the annual because it doesn't rejuvenate that soil. They tend to be very much about their one life cycle and you know, getting the seed and doing that. They do do a bit because we know, um, you know when we're pasture cropping to get that grass regeneration, that oats is better than barley, it was better than wheat sort of thing. So, yeah, so oats would, is, tends to recharge the soil at a higher rate than barley, than wheat. So, so they do do, oh, there's a uh, day next week that I'm doing with Cole at Echuca. So, but, do you know, like, so we know those things. So it is very important that we head it perennial. And, and it's all to do with that, that they feed the soil more. And, you know, we know that oats isn't as hungry as wheat. You know, like we would describe it as that sort of language. And it's that same thing with, um, with the annual grasses. They're very hungry, they're short-lived. So uh, yeah, an annual system will, will only take you so far. Yeah, and the, you know, like, uh, and this is like, this has been why I've enjoyed David Tongway. He's got all this stuff, whereas an annual system um, stops mineralizing nitrogen and forming, yeah, like, and, and so, yeah, they, they take, they can, they can be slow to start after the rain whereas the perennials will already be up and going, they're mineralizing even when they're dry. They're, yeah, they're actually fixing nitrogen in the soil when they're dry. So even though they look, yeah, they're dead and sitting there, or they look dead and sitting there, they're actually doing stuff that's not happening with annuals. So yeah, overwhelmingly, it's got to be that perennial grass. Well, I think Graham, this is, this is the aim would be to have live Live root systems going all, all year. Yeah, but that may not be possible, but it'd be nice to have, and like, and I think I've got to slide up further. You want that combination of winter growing and, and summer growing. Do you know, overwhelmingly, when you look at the explorers, they were summer growing native grasses all through here. Do you know, and there was over 35 of them. So all the good ones. So, um, yeah, stiper is sort of like plains grass and spear grass, and yeah, because I'm a Johnny come lately to all this, and 
uh, when I say to Cole Sice, you know, you could, couldn't, you could have thought of a better grass for the name. And, you know, he does that sort of thing. Well, Graham, we didn't think, he knows I like um, paspalidiums, so the native paspalums. And he goes, we didn't think that it'd work as a name, paspalidium. <laughs> so, but so there's, you know, so it's just, uh, we need to start with those annuals and then build on them to create the conditions for the lower successional, you know, plains and spear and wallaby, and then build from there to the summer growings and combinations of summers and winters and uh, of grasses that are really highly palatable. So um, I'm, not, I'm not a great speciesist. I really aren't that fussed whether it's a native or it's an introduced, as long as it's doing that work. Because if we do this stuff, if we make it stable, infiltrate and nutrient cycling, we're going to give ourselves time to then build it to whatever we want. Because you'll build that foundation, that healthy soil, I often get rung up and people will say, oh, I want to buy native grass and sow it. And you just go, oh, no. Because, you know, the soil's not going to be in the right condition or they would be there already. Do you know? So, you know, it's a long thing about how do we get that, you know, those fungal associations and start to get life back into the soil to make it suitable for those better grasses. So how are we working up towards that? So... Um, was that clear? Did I say that okay? So it's, it's some of those things. So I don't mind if you put in, like, you know, if they're, they're putting in, you know, Gatton Panic and Premier Digit and things like that down in southwest Victoria and they're getting them to go and stuff. So I, I think, you know, any way we can get it to be perennial, you know, you know, overwhelmingly we need it to be more native because they look after themselves really well in Australia and then you know that combination of plants and stuff so uh, how do we get that up so this is the this is the uh, the slide that I've put into just that that sort of life cycle of a perennial grass so a perennial grass is ready to be grazed when it has full broad leaves and it has fresh litter in the base um, of the plant and yeah, there'll be no cut-off tips where you can see where they've previously chewed. It'll be a deep, rich colour. Uh, it'll, Alan Savory's language is it'll look like it's never been grazed. So those cut-off tips, so say you had you know, uh, three leaves on a tiller and you, and you graze it down, they will have become the litter in the base of the plant. So I need to redraw this slide a bit, but can you, can you picture that sort of thing as it as they go, you know, as, as a grass plant recovers, it starts to put up tillers and it only ever maintains so many active growing leaves. It depends a bit on the species, but the one that's been researched to death is perennial ryegrass. So it has three actively growing leaves and then for the next leaf to emerge, that first one dies. And in southwest Victoria, or I usually shift it around. If I'm in Victoria, I usually say Tasmania or New South Wales. If I'm in Tasmania, it's Victoria. Yeah, so in Tassie, that's them branded as waste. But this is actually, uh, in southwest Victoria, they call it the stale lettuce in the bottom of the bowl. I'm saying it's the litter that's the soil food that drives the nutrient cycle, that provides that stability and water infiltration. So it's not wasted. So when the animals come in, you have a combination of animal food and soil food, and you put the soil food pushed onto the ground and the animal food through the animals. So we need to make sure that we're getting that cycle right. So they come in, they're severe grazers, our domestic grazers, which is great. So they clear all the growth points, cycle all that, push all the litter that was in the base onto the soil with their, uh, their feet and their muzzles. Uh, once it's in contact with the soil, it can cycle. Over time, the soil chews away at it and creates an air gap again, so it'll need pressing again on like an annual basis um, down onto the ground. The plant then shifts its uh, water-soluble carbohydrates or root reserves around to start growing leaf. Uh, as it grows leaf, it then becomes energy positive and starts replacing its root reserves, and then it's ready to be grazed when it's got fresh litter in it again. So it's that whole cycle from ready to be grazed, ready to be grazed. Now that's quite a long time, isn't it? If you're thinking a grass is just emerging now until they've got fresh litter 
And the visual I do for people is, and I've got it up further, I try and get people to lay the grasses over with their foot and picture if the, I ate all the green, and I'm not saying you do have to eat all the green, would there be enough litter to cover the ground 100%? So that's what we'll do in the trial area, because we'll take that trial area. I've been saying to people, I want you to be, have a small trial paddock that we can spot from space. That's how different it is in the landscape. It'll have all the perennials there, it'll have all the function, it'll have moderate decomposition of the litter. But you need to know how to do that with your grazing on your land, because once you know how to do that, then you can make a decision. Does it make sense to, to plant something, or will I have I got time to do this? So you've actually got a comparison. I know how long that's going to take, how much effort, what am I going to do? Am I going to do that, more of that or less of that? But you've then got that sort of ticked off and you've got evidence.